Has Hamas gone mad? By launching attacks on Israel that will surely invite devastating retaliation, what is Hamas thinking? Hamas has surprised the world, even though it achieved unexpected initial success in the first round of attacks. Israel's reputed Iron Dome defense system failed to fully withstand the dense rocket attacks. Hamas fired thousands of rockets at once, attacking all parts of Israel and causing heavy casualties. Hamas forces attacked from land, sea, and air, catching the so-called invincible Israel defense forces off guard. The famous Israeli Merkava Mk-4 tank was captured and soldiers were taken prisoner and humiliated. Mossad, the world's top intelligence agency, which is normally perceptive and clairvoyant, was completely unaware of the large-scale attack, allowing Israeli soldiers to be caught sleeping when the enemy stormed their barracks. However, although Israel paid an unexpected initial price due to its lack of vigilance, it is not difficult to judge that once the Netanyahu government comes to its senses, Israel will immediately declare a state of war and launch a crushing counterattack with its powerful military's overwhelming superiority. Judging from Israel's current mobilization, Israel has deployed its 80,000-strong military, equipped with the best weapons in the world, to attack Gaza. It goes without saying that Hamas forces, equipped only with light weapons and having no more than 20,000 combatants, are doomed to defeat. Two mysteries need answering, why was Hamas able to launch a successful surprise attack? And why is Hamas gambling against the odds, what is it betting on? To unravel the logic behind the facade, we must examine the realities of Middle Eastern geopolitics and undercurrents. Looking at the history of conflict between the Arab world and Israel, UN Resolution 181 calling for the establishment of Arab and Israeli states in Palestine was the origin of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. After the 1947 resolution was issued, Israel was founded in May 1948. The Arab countries, with a population of over 40 million, launched a war of annihilation against Israel, which had just 600,000 Jews at birth. The entire Arab world was of one mind, determined to drive the Israelis into the sea. As is well known, in each of the strangling wars launched by the Arabs, they were shamefully defeated, which in turn created Israel's myth of invincibility. Victorious Israel occupied large tracts of land that originally belonged to Arab countries. From a long-term survival strategy, Israel sought reconciliation, adopting a land-for-peace policy. Under U.S. mediation, this strategy first took effect with Egypt, the core power in the Arab world. In 1978, Israeli Prime Minister Begin and Egyptian President Sadat reached a peace agreement, for which they received the Nobel Peace Prize. In 1979, the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty was signed, with Egypt recovering the Israeli-occupied Sinai Peninsula and ending the 30-year state of war between the two countries. The Palestine Liberation Organization led by Arafat of Fatah, after repeated defeats by Israel, also gradually blunted some of its extreme edges, especially after its 1988 declaration of statehood, when Arafat clearly extended an olive branch to the international community and Israel. After being elected president, he announced the abandonment of all forms of terrorist policy and launched peace talks with Israel, eventually signing the Oslo Accords with Israeli Prime Minister Rabin in Washington on September 13, 1993. The Oslo Accords were a milestone in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Under the agreement, the Palestinian National Authority was established to administer Palestinian territories. The agreement also required the Israeli Defense Forces to withdraw from parts of the Gaza Strip and West Bank. 
The PLO recognized the state of Israel and pledged to renounce violence, while Israel recognized the PLO as representative of the Palestinian people. It is worth mentioning that Arafat, the legendary hero of the Palestinian Liberation Movement who supposedly swore lifelong celibacy to the cause of Palestinian liberation, in fact long harbored worldly desires to retire from the killing fields. As early as 1974, when invited to speak at the UN, he said what was considered the most brilliant line of his life, I have come bearing an olive branch and a freedom fighter's gun. Do not let the olive branch fall from my hand. Finally, due to reconciliation with Israel, in 1994 Arafat shared that year's Nobel Peace Prize with Israeli Prime Minister Rabin and Foreign Minister Perez. Of course, this peacemaker did not escape worldly desires in the end. At the age of 62 he fell into the nets of love, marrying a 34 years younger French beauty and having children with her. It is said that this freedom fighter secretly gave his young wife a huge fortune. It was the increasingly corrupt and inert PLO under Arafat that radical Palestinians saw as having lost its fighting spirit. Thus another extreme organization, Hamas, was born in the Palestinian territories, spreading like wildfire. Hamas too had a legendary leader, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, founder and spiritual leader of Hamas. Born in Gaza in 1936, Yassin was paralyzed from the waist down due to a spinal injury at age 12. This man who spent his whole life in a wheelchair exerted tremendous spiritual power. He studied the Quran assiduously, trained at Egypt's Al-Azhar University to become a prominent Islamic scholar in Gaza. In 1987 he founded Hamas, an acronym from the organization's Arabic name meaning Islamic Resistance Movement. From its inception, unlike the increasingly compromising Fatah under Arafat, the Hamas Charter openly declared its mission and ultimate goal to be the destruction of Israel, establishment of an Islamic Republic based on Sharia law, and rejection of any form of negotiation, calling for jihad instead. Under Yassin's call, some fanatics went to all lengths with indiscriminate attacks on Israel, with some willingly becoming suicide bombers, especially some young ignorant children who were either brainwashed or forced into becoming sacrificial lambs attacking Israel. After each suicide bombing, Yassin held memorial services proclaiming the bombers martyrs who had gloriously entered heaven. Israel finally could not tolerate Yassin. At dawn on March 22, 2004, as Yassin finished prayers at a mosque near his home, helicopters suddenly descended from the sky as bodyguards were escorting him to his car, firing three missiles that blew Yassin and his young son to pieces. Although Yassin was dead, the Hamas he left behind had already taken root in the Palestinian extremist soil. In 2006, Hamas even defeated Fatah in the Palestinian parliamentary election. However, Hamas refused to hand over its weapons to the state. Conflict erupted between Fatah and Hamas, and in 2007 Hamas seized Gaza, effectively splitting Palestine into two factions. Fatah controlled the West Bank, with a population of about 3 million, while Hamas controlled Gaza, with a population of about 2.2 million. In recent years, the situation around Israel has been relatively calm, and Hamas also seemed to show signs of moderation. In 2017, Hamas even passed a groundbreaking new charter, the first since 1988. Although it still opposed Israel, it proposed to establish an independent Palestinian state based on the 1967 borders accepting the basic position of the international community on the Israel-Palestine issue. After years of bloodshed between Israel and Palestine, there were signs of change, 
which were external reasons for Israel to let down its guard and reduce military vigilance in the recent years of peace. Although Hamas kept up military provocations, it did not organize large-scale attacks. Israel's undefeated military probably arrogantly believed Hamas had neither the capability nor the courage to launch major attacks. In addition, with intense partisan struggles in Israeli domestic politics in recent years, attention shifted to domestic issues, neglecting Hamas' animosity toward Israel and the fragile international context for Middle East peace. When Hamas launched this major military attack, Israel was clearly caught off guard. According to an Israeli military spokesperson, this was the most destructive attack Israel had suffered in its 75 years of existence. So why would Hamas, which seemed to be transitioning to peace, go to such lengths to launch this attack? What was behind this seemingly suicidal, futile act? The big picture in the Middle East is changing. With US promotion, Saudi Arabia as the major power broker may recognize Israel. If Saudi Arabia establishes ties with Israel, it will inevitably lead the Middle East further toward detente. Six Arab countries already have normal relations with Israel, and Saudi Arabia joining them would be a major event in the Middle East. Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen has said Israel is closer than ever before to reaching a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia. At the same time, there are signs the U.S. is pressuring Israel to make more concessions to the Palestinian National Authority, which represents the state of Palestine, to further upgrade its relations with Israel. None of this bodes well for Hamas and the international forces behind it, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and so on. For Hamas, its living space will become narrower, with the danger of even being eliminated from the game. Therefore, it is going for broke, stirring up a new Middle East war, to become the pole of an axis of Hamas-Syria-Iran in the anti-Western and anti-Israel camp, forcing Arab countries to choose sides again. Through this, it will gain discursive power in Palestine and a leading position. Of course this is a gamble for Hamas. If it cannot drag allied countries into the war, it will be thoroughly crushed by Israel and inevitably lose Gaza. But for the core calculation there are profound and sinister considerations of interest. For Moscow, the attack is a big favor from close ally Hamas. The Kremlin likely did not plot this conspiracy, but it benefits Russia, mired in Ukraine. At the very least, if another major Middle East war erupts, US and NATO attention will definitely be divided, somewhat easing the pressure on the Ukrainian front. But any overestimation of this potential benefit would be inappropriate. The combined strength of the Western alliance is enough to wage two proxy wars, and the situation may not deteriorate to that extent. Hamas suicidal behavior is fundamentally a gamble, not simple madness. It has its own logic and background. It may lose Gaza but does not lack places to regroup with borders near the West Bank, Syria and Iran. Through this war, it will become the axis of the anti-Western and anti-Israel camp, quickly harvesting broad support from Arab extremists. It will suppress the Palestinian self-government on a legal and moral level. At least Fatah will no longer be the center of the Palestinian liberation movement, while Hamas will be the fluttering banner. This military adventure may seem and indeed is crazy, but at its core there is a deep and sinister consideration of interests.